Good day, everyone. Um, this is Dr. John Ward. I'm the director of the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination, the Task Force for Global Health uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. Um, I'm also an associate editor with the journal Clinical Liver Disease. And this is our webinar series of um, looking at um, uh, contributions to the series Innovations in Hepatitis Elimination in Clinical Liver Disease. And I'm very um, excited to be joined today by um, Dr. Haile Michael Desali, uh, who has written about an assessment of non-invasive markers of liver fibrosis in patients with chronic hepatitis C um, in Ethiopia. Um, you know, efforts to simplify testing and care is a major effort all around the world so that we can scale up testing and treatment to reach the elimination goals for hepatitis C. But how to um, develop feasible, simplified care uh, um, uh, practices is a challenge, particularly in, in sub-Saharan African countries where there has been fewer research studies to help direct uh, best practices. So it's very excited to have uh, Dr. Destali um, uh, contribute um, the results of this assessment um, from um, St. Paul uh, Medical College in Addis Ababa. Um, so let me um, uh, have um, Dr. Desali join um, our conversation. And I'd just uh, like uh, for, um, uh, uh, if you would, uh, give everyone on the line a little bit of an, a brief description um, of, your, of your study, why you thought it was important to do the study, and some of the results are coming from it uh, that uh, you felt uh, you, you believe are, are most important. Uh, thanks so much, dear jo John Ward, for such an uh, excellent initiative on the global elimination series, and also for providing such opportunity to present and to disseminate information on viral hepatitis. So we, we started this uh, program on hepatitis C virus as uh, you know, the global hepatitis uh, prevalence has been estimated around 71 million and almost one sixth of this has been in the sub-Saharan African communities. And part of the sub-Saharan communities is one in the Ethiopia, which I've been doing the study, which I've done the study was also in Ethiopia with a population of uh, nearly 114 million. The estimated prevalence from the meta-analysis was around 3.1%. So there is a huge burden of uh, possible hepatitis C virus infection that needs treatment. But we have seen that in the Western world, the taste and treat approach, especially after the curative treatments has been, uh, uh, I've been able, this has been successful in the Western world or in developed countries. But when you come to our country, even I have seen patients who have hepatitis C within families or who have hepatitis C uh, and who cannot afford such kind of treatment because the treatment is still costly. It's not subsidized. And also all patients are paying out of pocket for both the viral load testers and also for the drug cost. So we need to prioritize which patients need early therapy that could be also to the individual level and also as a national level, because the DA treatments are not subsidized and patients cannot afford. So for such as a national and as an individual level, we need to prioritize treatment uh, for such kind of patients. So with this aspect, we try to see which patients might need uh, early treatment. So we have seen that fibrosis assessment needs as a gold standard a liver biopsy. And liver biopsy based on the different studies this we have seen that it's not feasible as there is a big inter and intra observer variability and it's costly and it's also an invasive measure. And the other option that had been recommended by WHO, we have seen that transient elastography is an option, but the problem is that transient elastography is it's expensive and it's not still widely available. So we were shifting to use the non-invasive tests that depend on the lab-based tests. So based on the WHO recommendation also, we have tried to validate the APRI, the FIB4 testers, and we tried to assess these testers to the possible gold standard 
to the transient elastography. And, they, and thereby we can recommend which patients could actually need early treatment, that which patient could have a moderate or severe fibrosis or cirrhosis so that they can need, they need early treatment and also to avoid the further, further complications of decompensation and cancer. If you treat them early, we can avoid all those. And, and the other important thing is we can cure them. So we want uh, to see this, such patients uh, to assess in any busy marker. So, and we, so as a methodology, we use the APRI cutoff that the WHO recommended and also other international guidelines. We tried to use the cutoff at 0.5 and also at uh, a level of uh, one. So we have seen the different cutoffs, 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and two at the different cutoffs. And for cirrhosis, we used the lower threshold one and two. And for the assessment of the moderate to severe fibrosis, we use the cutoffs 0.5 and 1.5. And try the, to assess the precision model by assessing the sensitivity, specificity, uh, positive and negative predictive values. And also we measure the row curves. And when you, when you do such studies, we have seen that that the WHO recommended labels at a higher cutoff, actually such testers, especially the APRI was having a very poor sensitivity. And for a curative treatment like hepatitis C virus, having a poor sensitivity, it's, it's really bad because hepatitis C treatment is curative. And if it has a low sensitivity, we are missing patients that need of treatment. So when we are using a lower cutoff value of APRI at one, the sensitivity has markedly improved. And the outlook of the, as you, are, as you have seen the, uh, in the study, the outlook was around 0.90. So with a better outlook and a sensitivity of around 77%, specificity more than 90%, with a rock of 0 0.19, we can for sure say that APRI as cutoff of one could have a better uh, diagnostic capability to, for cirrhosis, a better diagnostic uh, precision. So the lower cutoff of 0.5 also was for assessing significant fibrosis was also found to be better in this assessment. We have found also with this a better sensitivity and specificity at a cut of 0.5. So the lower threshold that had been uh, advocated by the WHO were good compared to the higher thresholds, which are one and two for significant fibrosis and cirrhosis respectively. So we want to show that if you are trying to, uh, one is if you are trying to use the these non-invasive tests that, that are important for resource limited settings because they are lab-based and the lower thresholds recommended by WHO have a better sensitivity and uh, row curves. And we also want to show that when guidelines uh, like international guidelines like WHO, so when they are trying to uh, guide other countries, they may re recommend countries to use their own data or studies because we have seen that this has also happened in hepatitis B. So because many of the studies were Asians, as you know, and Caucasians, and there might be also some biological difference. And this might not just extrapolate to the African setup as has been seen also in our study in hepatitis B virus. Very good. <clears throat> For those of you uh, on the call, uh, we have a Q&A box that, that you can uh, access by scrolling to the bottom of your screen and, and please uh, pose some questions, which I'm happy to, uh, um, to pass along um, during our conversation. Um, uh, it's a very interesting um, you know, study. I, you know, it struck me that you know, sensitivity is particularly important here for hepatitis C treatment decisions, given the, um, you know, the you know, the, the, the excellent safety profile of, of therapies, you're really most interested, I would think, in identifying those uh, persons who have uh, advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis uh, so that you can treat them early enough so they do not have a uh, ongoing risk of liver cancer because you did not catch their um, infection uh, quickly enough to prevent that fibrosis that puts them at risk for liver cancer um, in the future. Um, do you agree with that assessment or, or how do you view these 
uh, sensitivity, specificity, balance. Yes, you're right. So in such kind of therapy or HPC associate, uh, so we, we hear there are interacts with a good safety profile and also with a curative intent of more than 90%, we should not miss patients that are in need of therapy. So if the test has a low sensitivity, this may tell us that patients with cirrhosis, for example, will be, if you are using the cutoff of two and the sensitivity is around 30%. So in that case, we are missing almost 70% of patients in need of therapy. So that means we are letting the disease to progress to the compensation and cancer. And this is not uh, affordable actually in low and middle income countries also in other setups. So the sensitivity is very important in this uh, regard. We may not push the sensitivity in favor of specificity that may incur costs and additional costs if the, we are also aiming specificity. So we need to have a balance of the, these two, sensitivity and specificity. And with the applicator of us, we have shown that it was really a reasonable uh, sensitivity or in specificity, as you can see in the figure. So with this cutoff, it's important rather than having a sensitivity and specificity which are actually lower than 50%, that's really a bad test. Right, right. Um, Heather, uh, there, there have been some other studies looking at the FIB4 and APRI scoring for hepatitis C patients in Africa. So how, how do uh, the uh, results of your study compare to some other studies that have been conducted in Africa? Okay, thank you. So for the APRI, I have also studied us uh, in the hepatitis B. So uh, we ran uh, a big hepatitis B cohort in, in Ethiopia. We have around 1,300 patients that we are following in collaboration with Oslo University Hospital. So with this, we have also tried to assess the APRI, uh, the APRI in relation to the gold standard that we have used, uh, which is the um, transient elastography and some other studies also in Gambia, which have also used uh, assess the APRI sensitivity. So we have seen that the APRI at the cut of two has had a sensitivity of around 25% in our cohorts. Uh, around 10% to 25%. 25% were studies from the prolifica team in the Gambia. So Afri as a cut of two had really low sensitivity in the African setup. We have seen in the prolifica study in the West Africa and also in our setup. So it was around 10% to 25% uh, at a cut of two, also for the hepatitis B studies. And for the hepatitis C studies, we haven't seen much studies going on in Sub-Saharan Africa. So with this, I recommend actually to have, like we are doing in the hepatitis B, to have a pool of data uh, to collect our studies on hepatitis C. Uh, those who have similar data, like APRI or transient elastography. So we can have a large pool of data so that we can assess the APRI cutoff for the African data. So if you are having a large scale study or a collaborative study, we can probably have a good, uh, better sensitivity with a large sample size, and better representativeness can be present can be found from other collaborative studies. Thank you. So, in your own practice, uh, perhaps because you're at St. Paul's and you have access to FibroScan, uh, perhaps you continue to use that. But do you feel like the data are strong enough for you to change? your own practice, or do you feel like uh, more data are needed before you begin to make this a routine uh, care option? Yeah, and this is an important study to be uh, taken for my practice and also for uh, other low and middle income countries or those who can't afford test and treat approach for the hepatitis C. So I have seen that patients with uh, cirrhosis uh, coming, usually they are diagnosed late, either clinically when they have decompensation or when they have ascites. But this APRI as a cut of one can show as patients with compensated cirrhosis without clinically significant ascites or other markers that we see uh, in patients with decompensation. So it can try, it can tailor us to find patients as early as possible. So I'm actually doing in my practice, I'm looking at APRI at this cut of but when the cutoff is increased, like two, 
patients are actually having a severe disease and decompensation. So we want to avoid that. If you want to avoid that, we need to have a lower cutoff and a better sensitivity. So I'm actually using that. And as you said, I recommend actually, if you do further large scale studies, but it's still one point to consider also for the national guidelines. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you know, I know, I know, I know a number of um, you know, gastroenterologists, hepatologists in Ethiopia. I know you have a very strong professional association uh, there. Um, uh, so I know you have a number of, of specialists who are, are providing good care. And I say that just I'm interested in um, how much is hepatitis C becoming a uh, treatment that uh, more primary care uh, clinicians can provide, or is it still for some of the barriers that you mentioned uh, at the start of uh, our program, uh, such as uh, uh, patients having to pay for uh, treatments and, and care, um, uh, uh, it's still a specialist, uh, you know, specialist uh, 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 managed disease, or, or do you think it's trending or becoming in part by some of the results of the study that you just uh, published can be managed by uh, primary care physicians in Ethiopia. Yeah, thank you for that. I think such kind of platforms and increasing awareness are, are important, especially when you talk about hepatitis C. Because patients with hepatitis C, as I have said, the meta-analysis have shown that 3.1%. So if, if we increase the awareness to the frontline workers or to the primary uh, clinicians and they screen, they are able to screen more patients, we will get actually more patients in, before they have like cirrhosis or uh, the decompensation. One big problem is with, there is no strong um, like commitment or like I have seen the support from the Ministry of Health but that's not substantiated like with a partner support. As you, as you have seen, these partners has been supporting different programs, HIV, malaria, TB. And the same occurs like in other countries, they don't have such support in viral hepatitis, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So, so they are trying by themselves uh, to mobilize the associations, as you said, and uh, other physicians so that they can increase the diagnostic capabilities or the awareness and then treatment program. So it's not uh, still getting the high attention, no strong partner support uh, has been also found in viral hepatitis program. So awareness program, frontline physicians, and also increasing awareness, testing or increasing screening capacities uh, is very important uh, things to do. So the Ministry of Health has tried now like to there is a guideline in 2015. There's also a need to change the guideline now in 2020, and they are also doing that. But such kind of supporters uh, are very important to increase the awareness and uh, yeah, to, to scale up the treatment programs, like we have seen in the successful programs of HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had some discussions as a coalition with the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia about how we can help. Uh, bring those partners together because uh, you do have a new plan, I believe, for uh, for, uh, for for hepatitis, and uh, it would really be um, uh, it's a great opportunity to um, see what we can do more around hepatitis with the new plan. And I, I do sense that there's more recognition that more needs to be done uh, in Ethiopia because of the size of the problem and. Uh, we would really like to do our part to see how we could bring some more resources and capability uh, in, 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 to your efforts to, to scale up testing and treatment that you're speaking of. Um, um, yeah, do you have some, um, so um, are there other examples of programs that have scaled up effectively in, in Ethiopia? You mentioned HIV and TB, are those kind of examples of programs that have are going well in Ethiopia? Yeah, yeah, you know, such programs are going well in Ethiopia. Actually, there are partner support. As you know, the HIV programs, uh, the diagnostic capabilities are also the same platforms that can be used for viral hepatitis. 
but we have these machines which are which are used for the HIV programs, uh, but not for the viral hepatitis because there are no support or change of reagents. But still, there are this diagnostic capability. So, if as you know, patients with HIV and hepatitis B can have a free drug therapy because they can get free ART treatment. But if they have more infected with hepatitis B, they can't get the drug treatment. Still, the same is true now. So, the diagnostic capabilities, the machines that are used, and the drugs, especially for HIV, it is one drug that is for. Uh, for hepatitis B, it's important to leverage the resources that we have because we couldn't find many. We can use the platforms that have been used for HIV. There are HIV separate programs uh, and also the diagnostic methodologies can be used for the hepatitis programs and also for the diagnostic for the treatment. So it's really running well in terms of the awareness, uh, medias and everything and many people are aware of the hepatitis and one in one of the interviews i was giving a live interview one patient came and she said because of the poor awareness she told me that she can like openly say she has hiv but not hepatitis she was co-infected unfortunately but she told me that she can openly say she has hiv but not hepatitis b so still the, the awareness of the public that this uh, discrimination and stigma is still there because of poor awareness with the HIV program. So the HIV program is really well known by the public because of such supporters, but not hepatitis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just have us a full appreciation about how large is your practice? About how many uh, patients with hepatitis C in this case are you uh, caring for? And are there a large number that you feel like actually could benefit from treatment, but because of these uh, cost barriers are not receiving it? Yeah, so as I said, the hepatitis C, uh, the diagnostic cost is expensive. Like they should pay uh, around $10, it could be around 35 USD. I, I mean, I need to check the, the calculations, but uh, usually, they pay this, such kind of amount of money still now for hepatitis C viral uh, treatments starting from the antibody. And when they need the viral load, the cost will be increased. It could be around 350 USD for the viral load and genotype. One big problem is uh, that cause the diagnostic capabilities not available here. And most uh, laboratories send the specimens abroad to India, no, mainly to India and also to Germany. And once the COVID comes, and that become a big problem as the Ethiopian airlines that they have been using cannot ship the samples. And even now I have many patients actually who, do, who didn't get their viral load or genotype assay as RNA tests are important. In our country, it's difficult to treat based on the antibody test. We need the RNA test. Uh, I have seen that many patients who have antibody positive are RNA negative. That could be due to just the antibody exposure. And uh, we need to know the RNA tests to treat them. So the RNA tests currently, because of the COVID, are also not available. And the viral load machines that had been used for the HI programs now are also occupied to some extent by the SARS CoV 2 test for this COVID 19. So this also affected the diagnostic capabilities. The other problem is also screening is also affected, especially when the COVID started. Probably you have such a kind of talk, what COVID affects hepatitis. I know that you are doing some study, but I have seen that patients with, after COVID started, patients were not coming initially to our care and uh, screening capacity for hepatitis C was decreased. Actually, now after a short, a lot of time, now we are, we see patients with complications. Now they don't come with early features of Hep C, but with complications, with upper jaw bleeding, or with decompensation, or with cancer. So we we have a couple of patients, many patients on treatment with hepatitis C virus in Saint Paul. We have also uh, which has been considered one of the largest cohort of uh, hepatitis B program. Uh, we have a plan to scale up this treatment program of the viral hepatitis B to other uh, regions 
uh, to other regions of the country. And also hepatitis C, one big problem, as I've said, is the drug cost and the lapse of high patients who benefit when there is a drug validation test, they may get a free uh, test and they may need to pay for their money or when you get a free drug uh, funding or support, so they may need to pay for their lab cost. This is how we are trying to uh, treat uh, patients, but still based on the population size and the prevalence, we have still many patients in need of treatment. Those who can't afford, we are just following them. As I've said, I try to measure the APRI score of these patients and we'll try to notify them, we'll try to find uh, support for these patients. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank you. Um, you know, as a as a public health physician for 35 years, I just want to thank you uh, as a practicing physician of um, you know looking beyond your clinic and recognizing you know how we all have to work to pull together and really develop a, a coalition, as you mentioned, so that we can have a bigger health impact you know, than we can individually. I've always greatly valued my relationships with um, um, hepatologists and uh, professional associations like AASLD, because uh, you really need that connection between public health prevention and clinical practice to really have a big impact. And I, I just wanna thank you for, for this study and for really have you know filling this role for Ethiopia, and I really hope that you know I have an opportunity to work with you uh, through the coalition as we um, uh, seek out ways that we can work with the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia to to make hepatitis elimination a reality for the country. Yeah, thank you so much. We'd, we'd like to collaborate with your efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us today. I, I appreciate. Um, uh, your article again, please uh, I encourage everyone to go and, and read that um, and um, um, forward any more uh, comments um, um, to Dr. Dasali um, in, uh, in Addis. Thank you again. Thanks Have a so great much. day. Bye-bye. Thank you.